We're going to continue in our series on using the book as our foundation, The Thunder of Silence by Joel S. Goldsmith. And we're still in chapter 18, Ye Are the Light. And today will be part five, Ye Are the Light. And before I pull up the pass out, um, let's just think about what our goal is for the lesson, as has been the goal for all of the lessons on this series, especially on this chapter, Ye Are the Light. In this particular lesson, uh, Joel Goldsmith talks in the chapter about Moses and Jesus and how it was that this Christ, this spirit that we're talking about tonight, existed long before Moses and Jesus. The idea is that it exists now, this light. But when we get to it, the reading of it, we want to personalize it. We want to get into that place. We want to get into that consciousness. And you let this be an illustration of how we can begin right now letting our light shine the way Moses let his light shine, the way Jesus let his light shine. And remember chapter 18, the topic is ye are the light. My topic that I've chosen to use as a working topic here to anchor us is spirit of God, the spirit of God. The spirit of God in man is his conscious awareness. Now, that's what I perceive. And that's what I discern that is one of the main ideas that um, Goldsmith wants us to catch. Because when we say, let this light shine or let your light shine, what is it that is shining? And what does shine mean as a review? To shine means to demonstrate let it show up your consciousness practice the stuff make it real become it and let your consciousness announce itself wherever you are and wherever you go let your light shine Jesus let his light shine Everywhere he went, and everywhere he went, there was healing. There were miracles. Now, if that happened with Jesus in such a common and ordinary way, why should we see these kinds of experiences as being extremely miraculous and otherly? when they do happen in our lives, because they do happen in our lives from time to time. It's just not, it's just inconsistent. It's just here and there. And usually it's out of some urgency or emergency return to prayer because we got to make a change here. We got to demonstrate that as though we're, you know, have to get into some extraordinary state of consciousness in order to demonstrate slash let your light shine. Some of us, stay in that place on a more sustained level, on a more sustained basis, and we just see things unfolding and happening in our, in, in, our, in, in, in our presence, and we're just walking through life saying, look at here, look at there. We're, just am we're amazed, but we're not surprised. We're expecting things to happen that way. We're expecting things to show up that way. We're expecting problems to be resolved that way. We're expecting resolution here instead of irreconciliation there. Yeah, that's just a normal way of life for some of us. And it is, it is unusual and extraordinary when it doesn't work that way. 
And then we resort to prayer and say, you know, I need to concentrate on this and pray because I'm sort of out of source. So which way does life work for you? Well, that's what this lesson today is about. We are learning how to make this a norm and this to be our normal state of consciousness, not an exception when prayers are answered. My working topic is spirit of God in man is conscious awareness. What we have said and repeated over and over and over again is that these two words here, conscious awareness is really the, in, in my estimation, in my interpretation, in my understanding, the most powerful words and the most powerful concept that Joel Goldsmith is trying to get us to rise up to a level of understanding of that it was that it was the conscious awareness of the presence of God in Jesus, that he was the son of God, and that what God was, he was, what God is, what, what God is, he is. I and the Father are one. He was, he had a conscious awareness of that. I and the Father are one. He had a conscious awareness of that. He that seeth me sees the Father. He had a conscious awareness. These things I do, that you see me do, I don't do these things. It is the Father who is doing it through me. He had a conscious awareness that when he walked to the tomb before that Lazarus was entombed in to raise Lazarus from the dead, he had a conscious awareness that life cannot die. So I'm going to wake him out of sleep. He had a conscious awareness of not his power. He had a conscious awareness that he had no power of his own and that when he went to that tomb, he could not raise Lazarus out of that tomb. He knew that. He had a conscious awareness of that. That's what we want to hold on to and anchor throughout this lesson. Those two words and that concept, conscious awareness, with the goal being at the end of the lesson, you're walking into a conscious awareness that you're not going in and out of. You are maintaining and sustaining your, your, your consciousness in this conscious awareness that God is always working through your life. So let's read uh, what Goldsmith has said in chapter 18. He's, and I'm just going somewhere in the middle of the chapter where I'm just picking up someplace there, where he says, our purpose, our purpose, our function, our purpose, our reason for being, the reason that we're here, our purpose is to be, is to be the transparency through which the light, oh, oh ye are the light, the light, not we, but the light performs its mighty works. As I continue to read, think about Jesus. This was his purpose. He was transparent. He was a transparency, an instrument through which the light, not him, did the mighty works. And this, George Smith said, this is true of you. Ye are the light. We are, Goldsmith says, the instrument through which the divine can manifest and express itself on earth as it does in heaven. We are, you have to be consciously aware of this. We are never the doer, never the actor, but always the vacuum through which spirit flows, the conduit, the space through which spirit flows. Let us never for a moment believe that by our spiritual endowment, we will ever attain personal or spiritual power to heal, to demonstrate, to manifest, to do anything. No matter how many uh, credentials you have, or how many classes you had, or how many, whatever, whatever, whatever you achieve, hey, how long you, how many books? Uh, mm -mm. Let us never for a moment believe that our purpose for learning and growing is to be able to do anything because of our spiritual power. That is a misnomer. That is a distraction. That is confusing. And yet, if we 
really acknowledge it and admit it. That's what some of us have been trying to do and are trying to do. And it doesn't work. There is no room in spiritual living for egotism or for the exercise of personal power. God does not give his power, the glory, the dominion. God always retains it. It remains with God. And we are but instruments, humble servants, or transparencies through which that light may shine. Let your light shine. God can find entrance to the world only through consciousness. And so that's why I want to build up on this topic, the spirit of God. What is the spirit of God? The spirit of God in man is his conscious awareness of his presence, of God's presence in him and his presence in God, his conscious awareness of God and I are one. He that seeth me, the, seeth me sees the Father. I of myself can do nothing. It is the Father within me. He doeth the works. Goldsmith says, there was just as much God in the world before the time of Moses. There was just as much God in the world before the time of Moses, but it had no effect upon the Hebrew people until, until Moses opened his consciousness, received the light, and then was led by God, after which the liberation of the Hebrews was achieved. Important. He's going to say the same thing about Jesus in a minute, but he says, before the time of Moses, there was just as much God present then as there was after. But it had no effect. It wasn't being used. But what happened? Moses opened his consciousness and received the light that was there all the time. And then the world was changed. What is the idea here? The idea here is that these are words on black and white mean nothing until and unless you apply this to your life, consciousness, self in this moment, in this very moment. In this very moment, you affirm and you know that you open that eye, that we open our consciousness, receive that same light that was before Moses, that was before Jesus and that will forever be. And we, re and we will let our light shine proportionally to our illumination and Goldsmith has said this over and over and over. Goldsmith goes on to say, it was not that there was no good, no God in Egypt. God was there, but there was no consciousness to receive and release God into the world until Moses had his illumination. Moses had his illumination. And so yeah, we do, do doing from Tuesday to Tuesday, we are increasing our illumination. We're having our illumination. Illumination be our steps to understanding. That understanding comes from, we've been on that for a few lessons. Tap into that. There had to be a Moses, he said, before the Hebrews could be free. There was just as much God on earth before the time of Jesus. But it was only when a Jesus appeared and God consciousness could flow through him that the blessings took place, not only for that time, but for all time. And as we go forward, think about our topic, the spirit of God in man is conscious awareness. What we're going to see here as a report, what you look for is what was it that caused the God consciousness to flow through Jesus, that after that, the blessings took place, not only for that time, but for all time. So I'm reminding you what it was, his conscious awareness of his relationship with God 
Had there been no Jesus in the ship at the sea during the storm, had there been no Jesus in the ship at sea, the storm would not have been still. True, in that time, it would have worn itself out, but it would not have stopped so quickly. It was still, the storm was still because of the presence of Jesus Christ. Now, when we read the story as a miracle of Jesus, calming the seas and calming the storm. Our focus is on Jesus and the power of Jesus to calm the storm, to do this and to do that. But Goldsmith asks, what was it in Jesus Christ that stilled the waves? Unless you catch this, then you can't personalize it. You can't repeat the experience. The experience cannot be repeated through you. What was it in Jesus Christ that stilled the waves? Were the waves still because he had power over them? That's what's taught in the church. Or was it because he knew the truth which makes Men free, that's what's taught in your church, in your philosophy, in your teaching, in your ministry. No, 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 no. Not the power that was in Jesus to do these things, Jesus the man. No, the power was in his conscious awareness. The power was in the spirit of God that was in him. And the spirit of God in man is his conscious awareness of his relationship with God. It was because he knew the truth of who he was and the truth of what it was that was doing the work, who it was that was doing the work, that it was not his power because he knew the truth which makes men free and could therefore stand still and let, and let the omnipresence and power of God perform its function. That was the secret. That was the secret of the miracle. That was the secret of demonstration. That was the secret of his power. The secret of his power is that he had no power. The secret of his power was in his conscious awareness of his relation with God. All I need to do is be still and know and let my light shine. What is my light? My understanding, my spiritual understanding and my wisdom. He, Goldsmith says, there had to be a Jesus before the power of non-resistance could be made evident. Well, maybe next week, but one of these messages, my topic is going to be the power of non-resistance. The power of non-resistance. We're going to see it all through this lesson, but I need to, you, I need to make a specific topic on this, the power of non-resistance. There had to be a Jesus before the power of non-resistance could be made evident. There must always be someone. Are you that someone? Am I that someone? Will you be that someone? There must always be someone through whom the spiritual light can shine and who can stand still and bear witness to the presence and power of God as the only presence and the only power. This is your conscious awareness. This is your conscious awareness. What is your conscious awareness? That there is only one power and one presence, and that one power and that one presence is God. And that one power and that one presence is God in me, as me, through me. I and the Father are one. He that seeth me, seeth the Father. I have no power of my own. The Father within me, he doeth the works. 
And so he says, you make no attempt to exert power. All you do is remain still and behold the activity of God as it touches the lives of all of those around you. For example, if there's a disaster about you, it can go on and on and on until it exhausts itself unless one among us knows this truth. If it is to be stopped, dead in its tracks, there must be one who can stand still and realize that the grace of God, besides which there is no power, is in operation now. That's your affirmation. That's your declaration of truth. You stand still and let that grace work. Be still and let your light shine, is what Moses did. Be still and let your light shine. It's what Jesus did. Ye are that light. Ye are the light of the world. He goes on to say there must be one to be completely silent and bear witness to the spirit which steals the ways. My topic is the spirit. The spirit of God in man is his conscious awareness. We become the light of the world. Joel Goldsmith starts the chapter 18 off with this statement. We become the light of the world in proportion to our degree of illumination. So I repeat, week by week, we're becoming more and more illuminaries. We're becoming more and more illuminated. We become more and more. And the more illuminate, illumin we become, we're releasing more and more of the divine understanding because it is the divine understanding that is shining light through our consciousness right now, illuminating our consciousness. Let's look at the Science of Mind textbook and see what it says about consciousness. And then we'll come back to Goldsmith's writing. Consciousness, that's what we're talking about is consciousness. Ernest Holmes says consciousness is mental awareness, mental awareness. And consciousness is both objective and subjective. Objective consciousness, that we're talking about the spirit of God. Consciousness, your conscious awareness. Objective consciousness is the spirit of God in you. Objective consciousness is a state of conscious awareness, the spirit of God in you. And the spirit of God in you is the word. Objective consciousness is a state of conscious awareness equipped with will, decision, and discrimination. Its reasoning is both inductive and deductive. Therefore, it has self-choice. Now I'm gonna look at chapter six of the Thunder of Silence and see how it is that you can see an illustration here of this being practiced in real time. He says, there are many students of the healing art, Goldsmith says, who are still doubtful as to where to put their attention in healing, where to put their attention in demonstrating answer prayer. He says, should we hold the suffering and discord in mind? In other words, should you hold the problem in mind that you're praying for or praying about when you enter the silence? Should we think of the patient that you're praying for with or about? Exactly where is the attention of the healer to, healer to be placed? He says, well, the person who's coming to you for prayer has appealed to you and your willing response has established your rapport with him. And that is all that needs to be done in regard to a person. And your willing response has established your rapport with him. And that is all that needs to be done. You see, it was the father in you that caused the person to turn to you for help. And it was your love of serving that caused you to respond at agreement. 
there has been established a relationship of giving and receiving. And after this is established, you can no longer think of your patient. You, you no longer think of the person. And also in praying for yourself, you no longer think of yourself or your problem. Your agreement with him has been recognized. Where? How? In the kingdom of heaven. It is now on the plane of love. You see, you released it to God. You have no power to do anything about this. Your agreement with him has been recognized in the kingdom of heaven. It is on the plane of love. It is on the plane of God. It is in the spirit. Now you may forget the individual, forget the person, forget about yourself and remember that it is the father now that does his work. That's how you let your light shine by realizing, as A Course in Miracles says, I need do nothing. There is nothing that you need to do because there is nothing that you can do. You have no power, but you do your, that that you do in doing nothing is something, and that is being still, disengaging your mind. You are not treating the individual. You are not treating the person. The individual who has appealed to you has become the victim of some psychic fixation. He is apparently suffering from some false belief. And you are to dissolve that falsity. And how do you do it? It is destroyed. Wait a minute. It says that you are to dissolve that falsity, inferring, implying that there's something that you do. And what are we trained to do? You do your affirmations. You do your denials. You do the this. You do the ah. You're doing something. He says, it is destroyed just as light destroys darkness. How does light destroy darkness? We're talking about the spirit of God in man is his conscious awareness of the presence of God as light. And it is the light that doeth the works. How does the light do the work. The light does its work by shining, shining. And we got to repeat this over and over and over. Shining what? Shining understanding, shining truth. And that is the light. It is destroyed just as light destroys darkness. If you want to remove darkness from a room, you do so by establishing light. Well, that's thinking. Listen, we see this every day. For, for 365 days out of the year, we see this repeated over and over and over for 70 years for some of us, for 75 years, for 50 years, for 30 years, for 100 years. We see this over and over and we miss it. There it is in plain view. If you want to remove darkness from a room, you do so by establishing light. How many times we go into a dark room and turn on the light? But when we turn on the light, you did nothing to the darkness. That's what he's getting you to see. You do not concern yourself with the darkness. You do not concern yourself with the problem. You do not concern yourself with the sickness. You do not concern yourself with the situation, the condition, the circumstance. You concern yourself only with one thing, and that is the light. You turn on the light and maintain it. Disease is a state of darkness. And in order to remove the darkness, you turn on the light of health. Disease or problems, it's a falsity. And to banish it, you establish yourself in the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the truth dispels the falsity. You do not pay attention to the falsity. You stand still and let the light shine, it cannot stand in the presence of truth, which is the light. Any more than darkness can remain in the presence of light. Darkness cannot remain in the presence of light. When you turn on the light in a dark room, darkness vanishes, darkness disappears, and you haven't done anything at all to the darkness. You just turned on the light. You haven't touched the darkness. You turn on the light. Light never touches darkness because darkness is nothing. There's nothing to touch. Light does not dispel darkness by holding 
onto it by handling it. It dispels it, but not by you handling it, holding it onto it. Light simply stands and is radiant with its own glory. In other words, when truth is operative in the consciousness of the healer, it becomes operative in the patient through that hidden light of understanding which is already within him. This is an inner process, a spiritual process. It is not of the intellect or of the conscious mind, but takes place on a higher plane and through a deeper avenue of being. That which is done is done because of that which is known by the inner mind in secret. That which is done is done by conscious awareness of the spirit of God in you is God shining its light through you. That which is done is done because of that which is known by the inner mind in secret through the heart through the feeling, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. In the presence of light, no darkness can obtain. It simply is not there. Not that the light is concerned with the darkness, but being light, it is radiant. And in that radiance, there can be no darkness. In the light of truth, in the radiance of the glory of truth, there can be no disease, no problem, no inharmony, no ache or pain or suffering. And so it is.